So welcome everybody to, um, to the state of activism, where we're going to talk to Paul Posland, um, from, who's a barrister at Lawyers for Nature, and also Charlie Gardner, whose day job is a senior lecturer at, at the um, Durrell Institute of Conservation and Ecology, and also he is um, an activist and conservationist and works um, and is a spokesperson for XR. Um, Paul is also a conservation and um, an, an activist. The first thing that we want to do is to find out who is in the room with us. And so what we very much like to do is to find out what your state of activism is. Are you people who have done a lot, in which case we'll angle it to one point of view, or, or are you people who, who don't do very much and would like to find out more? Um, Ellie, Ellie, would it be possible to start the poll for us, please? There we go. So we've got four, four choices here. Um, and I'd love to know, you can do any of them, all of them, if you want, you may have done all of them. Great. So if we just do this poll for a couple of minutes, and whilst you're doing that, I'm going to remind you about how we uh, run these sessions. So the one that we're doing today, I'm actually going to open up chat for you as well, so that you can chat behind the scenes, make friends, comment on what's being said, put in links and things like that, because it's so, so unbelievably useful when people do that. I've certainly met people I've gone on to meet in real life through chat at these kinds of events. Um, so we love that. And I'm also going to ask you um, to answer some questions on chat to sort of do what, might, it's kind of like a little bit of a rainfall down the side um, so that we can see what, what the comments are from you. Um, the other thing, the, if you want to ask a question, however, and this is the one that I'm really going to be looking at, is the Q&A. So you've got down at the bottom, you can see the words Q&A. If you open that up, you will be able to type in a question there. Let me know who it's for. It might be for both of them. And, and also you can upvote questions, which if we get a lot of questions might be really useful. So if you read a question there, you think oh, that's exactly what I was going to say, just upvote that one. Um, if there is a question where Paul or Charlie want to know a bit more from you before answering the question, I may ask you to come on stage, which is possibly something you've seen it communicate before as well. We don't use that very often, but if that is the case, then we'll do it. Okay, so it's worth 45 minutes um, and hopefully you have finished the poll. So Ellie, how is the poll looking? Who have we got here? Oh, right. So this is very interesting for us. 96% of you have done things like signing letters online. Um, I mean, that can have a real effect. It can, for example, create questions in the House of Commons. That can be very effective. Participated in a planned march and demonstration, walking down the street, placard, beautiful. So 53% of us have done that. Demonstrated on an action, for example, a sit-in picket line, 14% of us and 3% of us, I don't know how many that is, I'm not entirely sure how many people are in the room, um, have done, have stuck yourself to something or, or done something on a motorway and done that much larger direct action. I'm not sure, Paul, Paul and Charlie, if you were allowed to vote, I don't think we were allowed to vote on that one. So it wasn't us, okay, it wasn't us. Um, lovely, thank you very much for that, that's great. Um, there is another thing that I want to, to show you now, I have to warn you, this might get you quite annoyed, um, and that is the design of it. So if you've heard it before, try and cancel out the sound because you know that it's gonna make you very annoyed, but I want you to feel the feelings that you feel. And I want to you were to tell me in chat what you feel, what are those feelings? Um, I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. And then where do you feel them in your body? Is it here? Is it your fingertips? Is it your brain? Where, where do you hold those feelings? Because what we're gonna try and do is get this conversation out of just the front brain, which is often where it lands and we're very logical and, you know, gosh, we could do this, gosh, we could do that, and actually put it into our bodies because that is much more useful. Um, and it's also what you need in order to spur you on to do one of these actions. And so we'll be understanding how Paul and Charlie feel when they're doing this kind of thing. Um, so Ellie, could you play? My, my dreadful film. Thank you very much. 
Um, I do think they're harming their cause. I completely disagree with you, Armando. I don't think they do have a just cause. Um, I don't want to just stop oil. I want to keep oil. I want to uh, keep gas and fossil fuels. The reason why we live the lives we do in the West in the 21st century is thank God for fossil fuels, which delivered the Industrial Revolution. I would like that Industrial Revolution delivered to everyone around the world, the billions of people who survive on you know, a couple of dollars a day. Uh, and are scrabbling around for, to have, make a life for themselves and keep their children alive. I so, Julia, so I when you've got the UN saying, as Armand is referring to, that there's no credible pathway now it's to complete reach load of nonsense. Five. That's not backed up by the latest IPCC. Okay, well, that, listen, it is I, I don't know. Uh, maybe backed you know better than the UN. This is what the UN are saying, it's, and it's that the current policies may lead to 2.8 degrees it, it, it won't. These, are, these, those, those climate models have been, they have been exposed as complete nonsense again and again and again. They are the most extreme end of the scientific models complain, contained in those IPCC reports. But the point is, even if it were true, even if it were, would that necessarily be an issue? But that's aside the point for the kind of protests we're seeing. Because I think the issue here is you've got a lot of very entitled middle class people who've led a very nice life. Do we know they're middle stop... class people? They pretty much are, actually, yes. I think we do. Um, they, want to, they, they want to stop other people living names? good lives. Yeah. If you want <laughs> to have checking if them you, out individually. If you, want to have, if you want to have um, limits on people's ability to access fuel, you want to make it more expensive to get a plane abroad, to use a, to use a car, to heat your home, you are going to be harming poorer people and you're going to be harming poorer people in the developing world in my view these people are not just what well, I think they're, ta they're tantruming toddlers who've clearly never been told no by their parents I think it's time we told them no I think they are deeply deeply immoral in what they're doing it's actually. the developing immoral. world that's saying this has got the to world stop isn't saying it's this. the they're developing really world that's saying they're we're really on not. fire they're really not the world is not on fire and the world is not going to die and we're not going to die this is catastrophizing stuff that is not actually in the scientific sections of the, the, the IPCC reports it's not and there wasn't a pandemic Science is all subjective and it's... <laughs> okay, lovely. So now, in the chat, um, would it be possible for people to write down, to be open, open chat, so go to the bottom of the screen, open up chat, there you go, and write in, how, how did that make you feel? Where did you feel it in your body? And one more thing, what did you notice about the other people? that were not Juliet Hartley Brewer speaking. What were the other people doing? What did you see on their faces? What did that look like? Wow, we can see these. Yes, I'm feeling sick. Anger in my torso, anger riding, rising in my chest. Shock, yes. Frustration, rage. Yeah, gut clench, sick. Despair, disgust. People were hiding their haters, they, they really were. And also, yeah, lots of this, it's unbelievable. Why are they letting her talk? There we go, that is an interesting question. Fear, it made me want to cry. Others looked uncomfortable and also were in disbelief, very much so, yes. Okay, and angry that she was given the platform, right. So this is probably how people feel when they are doing these actions. Um, I just wanted to, to get that kind of response from everybody. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Paul. I'm gonna go with Paul first of all. What we're going to, the way that we're gonna do it is Paul is going to introduce what he does now um, and also how he got there, what the story is, how did he get there? If you are somebody that ticked the, the, the top box, how on earth, you know, do you want to go that far? What, what, think about it for yourselves. Is this, is there another step that you could take? What would make that happen? So first of all, I'm going to go to Paul and he's going to tell you his story. Thank you. Um, so I was uh, just an ordinary civil commercial barrister, not really doing any form of activism up until around five or six years ago. Um, and I came into activism through a love of nature. Um, I very much fell in love with nature in my 20s um, and wanted to uh, plant trees. But then as soon as I was starting to plant trees, I was like, ha, huh, tree planting is actually quite hard. Um, and maybe we should try and keep the existing trees that we already have as a kind of basic uh, starting point. 
So I then um, tried to find if there was a group for lawyers to volunteer to protect trees, and there wasn't really. Um, and so I started doing it. I represented um, a group in Sheffield trying to save 17 and a half thousand street trees um, and really got into that kind of nature protection activism, which still forms a key part of my activism. That's what Lawyers for Nature is all about. And actually, the reason I join you in this slightly drab waiting room is this morning I was just before this, I was representing a group of tree protectors in London trying to protect a tree from being destroyed. So it's still a crucial part of my activism. Um, but a big turning point for me, and this is a slightly odd story in some ways, um, in July 2018, I got a Facebook message from this random guy out of the blue who was like, hey, you seem like you're doing interesting things in the world. I want to meet you for a coffee. Um, and I was like, I, I, this is one of the first time I said yes. So I said yes and um, met up for a coffee with him. And we spent quite a long time just talking about the climate crisis and about the complicity of the climate crisis with the legal, legal system with the climate crisis and all this kind of thing. Anyway, that guy was Roger Hallam um, and who, who founded XR. And so I found myself um, with at the first declaration of rebellion for XR. And I personally don't um, like saying sort of public uh, declarations unless I truly mean them. But I actually did join in the XR Declaration of Rebellion in October 2018 and found myself meaning every single word of it. Um, and since then, I define myself as a climate activism and sorry, a climate activist and uh, have put in as much as I can do um, within my profession that I work in um, to try and uh, halt or slow down the climate crisis and to protect nature. Um, I think there's a few observations I would make from what I've done in activism over the past few years. And the first is the difference between, um, if you like, direct and indirect activism. So, for instance, with the tree protection activism that I've been involved in, there's a really direct causal relationship between what you're trying to protect and the activism you're doing. And actually, that's a lot easier to do. It's a lot easier to win with because it's literally like, you know, usually often older women, particularly standing under a tree outside their house saying, this is my tree. I love it. And if you want to take if you want to destroy this tree, you'll have to move me first, which is a very strong, powerful moral message. But of course, it's a message which is much, much harder to do um, with um, uh, cl the climate crisis because uh, there isn't one uh, there isn't one place where it's happening. Its tentacles stretch into to almost all aspects of our lives and every aspect of our current society. So although there are some ways that you can have a more direct relationship to it, so for instance, trying to blockade an oil refinery, um, you have to often take a more indirect approach, such as Just Stop Oil have been doing recently, which then gives you gets you into sort of trouble with a lot of people who say, well, what's the actual connection between what you're doing and ending the climate crisis? So that, that's a problem that I think we somewhat face. Um, the other is between what I would describe as the, the micro and the macro. And actually, in some ways, both are insufficient. So the micro is sort of doing real small actions that you can do right away, right here, right now, that have an impact. Um, and that you don't need anyone's permission for. So for instance, planting trees. We can all go out and gorilla plant trees tomorrow. And that's something that I've been doing a lot over the last few years. And it's really good for your mental health um, and for keeping you nourished in your activism, I would say. Um, however, it's also not sufficient. You know, I've been planting lots of trees along the river that I'm trying to restore in London. But if we don't deal with the climate crisis, those trees are gonna be underwater. So ultimately pointless. Um, so there is also a need to act on a much higher level as well, but also that can be quite challenging because it feels like it's never gonna change. And if we're honest, we're probably never going to win in the, in the usual sense. This is not a battle that we will look back and go, right, well, we did that, all sorted. At best, we're going to have a kind of messy point where we stave off the worst of it, um, and, uh, but never truly succeed in a sense. But I do think it's really important to cycle between those two things, um, because 
as I say, one can have a big impact at the, the macro level, but at the micro level, it really helps you to, um, to keep going, to understand that you're making a difference, that you are making a change. And when I've had a tough day um, dealing, yes, someone who said about the tree planting, yes, right tree, right place, um, which is also a reason for doing it very locally as well, actually, like getting to know an area and deciding where trees should go. Um, but yeah, when I've had a tough time, I feel like we're getting nowhere with the climate crisis. I kind of see my kind of tree babies growing and kind of feel a bit um, uh, motivated to continue. Um, the final thing I want to touch on is the idea that activism should extend into all areas of our life. And I think this is something really important to note that you don't just have to climb onto a gantry or glue yourself to an oil refinery. Um, but we can take things far beyond just signing generic petitions. Um, and this is something I've started to do recently. I was, um, my activism had got a bit stuck between just going to XR events and I felt like it wasn't necessarily going anywhere. And then I saw people getting arrested for Just Stop Oil and it really affected me um, to know that there are people in jail right now who have made one of the ultimate sacrifices of their freedom for this activism made me think well actually if I can't get arrested because of my job what can I do and that what can I do I realized although it was kind of difficult and socially awkward was very possible for me to do so I went and just put a plaque printed off a placard and sat outside the main um, place that lawyers and judges go for lunch and just sat there silently just saying the client the bar barristers must act on the climate crisis and I've started doing that at those kind of events and they're going to continue to do that over the coming months um, to really call out the relationship of my profession with the fossil fuel industry. Um, I also stood for election for one of our professional bodies on the pure issue of climate change and I don't know if I'm going to win this issue, I don't know if I'll be able to break the links of barristers with the fossil fuel companies. Ms. Sorry, Pam as a court. Can you come I don't know if I'll be able to break that link between barristers and the fossil fuel industry. But what I can see happening is really shifting the window of discussion over. And where, as before, we were just talking about um, putting solar panels on the roof of chambers. Now people are starting to say, well, they're starting to discuss the links between the bar and the fossil fuel industry, even if it's just to say that crazy Powsling guy is nuts and I disagree with him. I don't care. They're talking about it and they weren't talking about it before. Um, so I really I do think as well that it can have a lot greater impact if you're within that profession yeah. or within within your own circle rather than coming from outside of it. Like I'm reasonably sure that if XR protests had come with a noisy protest outside the hall, they would happily just shift them away and ignore them. Um, uh, there's a question there, I'll talk about in a second. Um, and uh, they, they could just shift us away. But actually, I was there in my barrister uniform um, and they knew I was one of them and it definitely jolted them. Like it made them feel really uneasy. And they tried to remove me, but I said, I'm not going to leave and you'll have to carry me out of this area and I'm going to film you and put you on Twitter saying you don't agree with free speech. And they were like, oh, guess we'll leave you awkwardly sitting there, but we don't really like it. And that's kind of where I want to be in this kind of stuff awkwardly jolting them into something. Um, the other way, and again, this is quite socially awkward, is to start in your social grouping. So now when I perceive that people in my friendship circle are not really doing anything in the face of the climate crisis or actively making it worse, I'm sort of being willing to call that out more, which is socially very difficult, but also quite effective. In general, I think people often react more strongly um, to uh, to those who they perceive as close to them or within their own grouping than someone coming outside of it saying you must change. So in short, I just really believe that there is a role for everyone, that the ubiquitous nature of the crisis, the fact that it stretches everywhere is both terrifying and difficult, but also means that everyone has a role to play and that that role can be somewhere between just signing a petition online versus having to go and get yourself nicked for sitting on top of an oil tanker. Um, and I'm keen to see if we can explore uh, ways of doing that. And I'm slightly at my time, so I should give over to Charlie, but I'm happy to answer the question someone raised about what the link is between the bar and uh, the climate fossil fuel industry.
Thank Great, thank you, Paul. We'll do the questions a little bit later. So for next thing is Charlie is going to do his um, five to 10 minutes. Okay, Charlie, over to you. Thanks, Alison, and, and thanks, Paul. It was really fascinating to hear your story. It's, it's quite a familiar story, I think, amongst activists. It, you know, so many people get into activism through the slow realization um, first, that you know, everything they're doing is not sufficient. Um, and then the second realization that actually they have power as individuals. We have agency to influence those around us, the organizations around us and, and the general public. My story, um, I think, is, is parallels, Paul's, in many ways. I'm a, a conservationist. And ever since I was a very young child, all I've ever wanted to do was have some impact to, to save the natural world. And I spent most of my career on, on the front lines in, in conservation. I worked in Mauritius helping save some of the world's rarest birds. And I, I spent 10 years living in Madagascar helping establish new protected areas, new parks and reserves. But I always felt uncomfortable with conservation. I always felt it wasn't enough. Because while we were on the ground saving the last scraps of biodiversity, nothing seemed to be happening to address the root causes. We were addressing the symptoms, the deforestation and the logging and the overfishing and all the rest. But the drivers, the incessant economic growth you know, was continuing. So I've always felt the conservation sector was a bit limited. On the one hand, it's hugely successful in that we have developed a really effective toolbox and we know exactly what we need to do to conserve biodiversity. We know how to stop deforestation. We know how to harvest species, fish and others sustainably. We know how to bring the most critically endangered species back from the brink and we know how to restore landscapes. But we're also hugely unsuccessful in that We've completely failed to influence the world beyond our sector, the conservation sector. We have completely failed to convince the public that what we do is important, and we fail to convince our leaders that conservation is important. So while we know what to do, we don't have the money to do it at the scale we need, and we don't have the supportive policy frameworks that will allow us to do this. To give you an example of how insufficient conservation is, the global, the global budget for spending on all our parks and reserves all around the world is the same as the amount spent every year on beard grooming products. It's less than one third of what we spend globally on ice cream. That is how much the global public and our leaders care for the conservation of biodiversity. And as a result, so even today, we're suffering this rampant biodiversity loss. When I was a child in the 1980s, I used to lie in bed worrying about tropical deforestation. And it, I never would have dreamed that tropical deforestation would still be rampant when I was 43. And yet, here we are. Um, and so I think we need to ask ourselves, why? If all the science hasn't been enough to trigger change why and so for the last few years i've been thinking a lot about this relationship between scientific knowledge and and societal change and the political action that drives societal change science has told us that we cannot survive without the living world and yet we consider it less important than ice cream there's something very wrong here and both um, the destruction of nature and climate change, I think, are really good examples of to, to explore this, this faulty connection between scientific knowledge and, and change. I think environmentalists and scientists, we've been really, really naive for a long time. We've had this idea that our job is to generate information. And if we generate information, society will act on that information because it will be accurately communicated to them. And, and most importantly, our leaders will use that information to make wise decisions in the public good. Now, climate change and nature destruction are clear examples that this is not the case because scientists have been providing our leaders with this information for 
you know, four or five decades, and yet no action is being taken. Emissions continue to grow and grow and grow. Nature continues to be destroyed. Um, so I, th I think we, we need to re-examine our theories of change. If information alone is not going to, to lead to the changes we so desperately need, what else can we do? And I think the first thing is we need to remember that, yeah, when environmentalists and scientists are talking to governments, giving our information to governments, we are not the only people that are speaking to governments. Governments are driven by an economic growth imperative, and they are also listening to lobbyists from other industries, the fossil fuel industry, agribusiness industry, agrochemical industries, aviation, cars, construction, steel, cement. All of these industries are trying to persuade governments not to put in place regulations to limit emissions and conserve nature because the, such regulations would limit their ability to do business and make profits and so while you know while scientists and environmentalists we're going to the information we're going to, to governments to try and persuade them and we're going with graphs and data but these lobbyists are also going to the governments to try and persuade them and they are doing so with vast piles of cash and of course Graphs and data are not very influential in the face of vast piles of cash. So we see that you know, decision making isn't about knowledge at all. It's about power and influence. Having knowledge isn't enough as environmentalists. We need to become more influential. We need to become much, much harder to ignore because we've been easily ignored for decades. We've not even just been ignored. We've been ridiculed. And that has to change. So when I first saw Extinction Rebellion on, on the telly at that event that um, Paul was at in, in, in 2018, I realized that actually here was a way that I could become more influential as an individual. Here is a way that I could become more powerful and much harder to ignore. <laughs> and I also felt that I, I, I felt this was you know, what I'd always been waiting for all my life as, as, as a conservationist and nature lover. I'd sort of, I'd, I've been quietly wishing that the general public was out on the streets caring for nature as much as I did. And finally, people were, and it, it, was, it was just wonderful. So I started um, taking action with, with Extinction Rebellion. I formed a local group near me in, in West Norfolk. And for a good year or so, I was acting just as an individual, um, as a citizen. Um, but soon I realized that actually, I'm not just a citizen, I'm also a scientist. And society um, has a lot of respect for scientists. We, we put a lot of faith in them and, and we listen to them. So ever since then, I've been taking action specifically as a scientist i, I act with, with with two groups a one um subgroup of extinction rebellion called scientists for extinction rebellion and also a sister movement called the scientist rebellion I've, I've been arrested twice the the second time was at cop 26 last year so um a year and three days ago um scientist rebellion we blocked the bridge with chains around our necks and it was the the first ever mass arrest of scientists over this planetary crisis. And why, why you know, Paul talked a little bit about the difference between sort of direct activism and indirect activism. And he made the point that direct activism is, you know, explicitly trying to prevent certain bits of destruction happening, indirect activism is about trying to have a larger influence. And this is what I do. So when we did that, that um, bridge block at COP26, when we, when we examine an action like that, it's, it's, it's easy to assume that the, the audience for that action is the delegates at COP26, governments. But for me, it wasn't. For me, 
getting arrested like that was an extension of my communications. For me, the audience for my action was the general public. And for me, getting arrested was an expression of acting in an emergency. And that, I think, is why it's so important. Environmentalists and scientists have been saying that we need to take urgent action and urgently transform our society for decades. And yeah, yeah these, these words are easily ignored now because we've been saying them so long and, and, and they're drowned out by other messages. When I got arrested, it was an expression of, it was a manifest, manifestation of my words that this is an emergency. Now, so, and I think this is really, really important that environmentalists you know, step up and start, and start walking the walk a little bit. If I was to tell you now, that I can smell smoke coming up the stairs and I think there might be a fire downstairs in my house and yet was to carry on chatting on this panel, of course you would not believe me that there is a fire downstairs because my actions do not match my words and it's actions that count, it's actions that influence people, not words. And I sort of worry that, you, you know, subconsciously, there are, there are members of the public sitting there at home sort of subconsciously thinking, well, we've heard all this stuff from environmentalists for, for decades, but if things were really that bad, surely they'd be out on the streets. Surely, if we were all about to you know, lose everything, then surely these people, these scientists would be out on the streets trying to make themselves heard. But if they're just sitting at home getting on with their jobs and you know trying to fulfill their personal ambitions and stuff it's, it can't be that serious honestly it can't be that serious otherwise they wouldn't just be sat at home so for me um i, I think this is why it's so important that, that we're talking about activism at this communicate conference because for me activism is a form of communication it is the ultimate form of communication and I hope we'll get, have a chance to, to chat about that a bit more in, in the uh, Q&A, perhaps. Thank you. You're muted. Sorry, Alison. You would think I'd have learned that one by now as well. Um, thank you, Charlie <laughs> um, and Paul. That was wonderful. Now, I can see there are three questions in the Q&A. And I also remember that I forgot to say who on earth I am. Um, so when you said, Charlie, when you said socially awkward, that these things are, it's the socially awkward stuff. Actually, I can't remember if it was Charlie or Paul, but it is, it's, it's that, isn't it? It's that little bit of talking to somebody who you know and who there is, there is a slight risk that they won't like you after, we, after you've done it. That is pretty much what I do nowadays. I have, um, I used to work in conflict resolution on environmental issues, well, still do. Um, less so now though because that's so time consuming and um, and more on difficult conversations which is exactly that and so I came to that having done many years work 30 years work um, with organizations called, like the Environment Council and like Science Wise in central government in fact my first job was this is this age as me the Brent Spa so that was Greenpeace and um, and Shell and all the others actually, it was known as being Shell, but really there were lots of others in there as well, um, talking about the Brent Spa, which is an, an oil storage platform that was broken and was bobbing around in the sea and needed to be disposed of. Um, it had a very good outcome because it was, um, it was talked about by many, many, many people at the same time, you know, facilitated, a big facilitated thing. Um, that, that really worked. And then I adopted a child and realized that there was actually a whole level underneath that, that sort of architecture that we do with facilitation and added in there, therefore some trauma into that. Um, interestingly, whilst I was at the Environment Council, I lived in what was called a Greenpeace house, which just meant that everybody who lived there worked at Greenpeace. Apart from me, in fact, I worked at the Environment Council. And I remember one day coming in, this shows you just how activism is not new. In the mid nineties, I came home at 11 o'clock at night as we did, you know, after the pub, and I couldn't open the door. And, and I thought, what's going on? I heard a little grunt behind the door. And then I slowly, slowly the door opened. And as far as the eye could see, there were penguins 
people dressed up as penguins all the way into the hall, into the kitchen, all the way up the stairs and in the language, in the landing. And, and it was just absolutely full of penguins at midnight. And they must have stayed there until about four o'clock in the morning. I got up in the morning, they'd all gone. And then I turned on the television and there, of course, they all were protesting. So this is not new. Um, it has changed. It has become in some ways more hysterical, sadly, um, and in some ways really, really effective. So, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. And then just the last thing, you were talking about information there, how information doesn't land. And yes, right from the very beginning as well, one of the first things that my chief exec of the Environment Council ever told me was, you know, he used to ask this question of people when he went in and they'd never heard of this idea of facilitation and talking to people that don't agree with us. And, you know, at that point, Greenpeace did not meet Shell unless it was on question on, on um, Newsnight, not even question time, Newsnight. You know, people like Greenpeace just were not on the television at all. Um, and, and my chief exec used to go out and say to people, he really couldn't think about, what do you mean it's an emotional thing? Surely it's all about data. Um, and he would say, well, you know, how did you choose your partner? Was that, did you write a list of pros and cons? And of course, no. And then you realize that all the major stuff you decide in your life is emotional. Many of the th things that run us in our life are emotional. And that is also why I got you to have a look at um, the Juliet Hart Hartley Brewer video at the beginning. Okay, so that's a little bit about me and why I'm here. So the difficult conversations idea is probably it. So we've got three questions and Tom, you were the first. Um, so I'm just gonna go straight to that one. Um, XR was very successful expanding the Overton window. Now, could um, I think this one was for Paul. Paul, could you explain the Overton window and then answer that question? Can you see the question? Yep, I can see it. Um, so the Overton window is generally the um, allowed range of discussion um, on a certain topic. Out, if you're outside that window, you basically don't even get a chance to talk about what you want to talk about. Um, so it's the acceptable range of discussion. And for instance, the right wing in the UK have been very good at moving the Overton window, say, on migration much further to the right, so that even those who are on the left of that discussion allegedly that the Labour Party are actually often quite right wing because the Overton window is really shifted over. And so we want to try and do that with climate. So for instance, in the barrister profession, uh, the Overton window at the moment is just how can we make the profession net zero? So make our own buildings, put solar panels on, turn lights off, which frankly is at best irrelevant, at worst a dangerous distraction. So I'm desperately trying to shift the Overton window over to make um, the work that we do facilitating fossil fuel companies, which is big, I'd say, a London lawyer is probably in the top 20, definitely top 50 profession in the world for facilitating the fossil fuel industry, could have a massive impact if we stop doing it, trying to shift that into the conversation. Even if it's not accepted by most people, just bring that into the conversation is the first thing. Um, very quickly, this also links to the other question someone's made about Just Stop Oil. Yeah. Uh, with Just Stop Oil, they're getting people talking, but what do we do about the fact that, you know, some people say, well, you know, I agree with their principle, but they're actually turning me off because they're so, they're, they're disrupting ordinary people. This actually links in with something Charlie mentioned towards the end of his talk, which is basically the bystander effect, which is a well-known effect that, for instance, if there's um, uh, a robbery or even a murder going on, people won't intervene on the street if other people aren't, because they assume that they'll only do it if other people are, and it takes someone to break that effect before anyone will intervene. It's the same with the climate crisis. There's a massive bystander effect going on that loads of people know how serious the climate crisis is, but think, oh, well, it actually can't be that serious because then surely someone will be doing something. But of course, it needs some people to go first. And actually what Just Stop Oil is doing is really breaking the bystander effect on society um, by going out there and doing something. And it's, I think, working. For instance, it worked on me. I reinvigorated my activism and started going and doing awkward stuff at the bar because they, I was like, oh, Just Stop Oil are willing to go to jail for this. It really is serious, actually. I should do something. And actually, if a few of you are inspired by what I say today and go out there and do that yourself, then you will also be in that train of people whose bystander effect has been broken by Just Stop Oil. And that's something important to note. Um, I'd also say very quickly as well that we need an ecosystem of activism and interventions. We need lots of different people pushing at different pressure points. Because, yeah, you're right. Um, Just Stop Oil aren't going to um, convince people for the change we need um, because they are uh, too radical, but they're bringing the topic into people's minds. And then we need other 
other organizations um, to come along and say, hey, you may, might disagree with their tactics, but if you agree with what they're, if you agree with what they're saying, you, what the problem is, come to us, we've got some solutions and using that to kind of push their activism along as well. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and Charlie, you wanted to say something, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, Paul has, has likely actually just said it right at the end there, but I wanted to reinforce this point about the different types of, of agents for, for change and the different types of institution that can push change. Now, there's a lot of pressure gets put on um, activist movements, uh, a lot of questions about how are you actually going to implement this change. And I think this, this question is, is very poorly framed because activist movements are I, I see us as the fire alarm. Our job is to, to shake society out of its slumber. But the fire alarm doesn't put out the fire. The fire alerts us to, to the need for, for a problem. It's other actors in society, as Paul said, that then have to step into the space that activists have created. Activists create will, public will. It's then for others to step in, be the reasonable voice, the acceptable voice, and take others along with them. It's, you know, activists don't implement changes. We, we, we create a need for changes. And the types of organizations that have to be making these changes are probably the types of organizations that many of you on this call work for. It's NGOs, it's civil society, it's, um, it's, it's community groups, scout groups, it's your schools, it's your businesses. This is who is going to be implementing the changes. So um, I think there's, you know, there, there, there's a, a two-pronged effect. There's the, there's the radical flank, which shifts the Overton window, um, but it's up to everyone else to step into that space that we've created. And obviously, I, I would urge you all to... Um, to please join activist movements and do what you can in any other ways. But at the same time, you must also be taking, making the most of the opportunities that activists are creating for your organizations to push for change. Yeah. That, um, that also relates into this latest thing by a comment by Stephen, how, how do we get this critical mass? Well, actually, as I mentioned, direct talking to people um, does make a difference. There are 100 people on this call. If everyone here spoke to 10 people and convinced them, that's a thousand. You don't, doesn't have to be that many more stages before that's quite a lot of people. And also this fire alarm thing of, if, imagine if you go to a conference and there's someone sat outside with a placard saying, I'm terrified of the climate crisis. Like that one thing is not gonna change everything, sure. Um, but it, it, if that's done enough, if everywhere you go, there is somebody saying, this is a problem, this is an emergency it's going to, I think, have an effect to, to wake people up. Um, I also realize we're running out of time. There's one question I wanted to answer very simply. How do you prevent activist burnout? Very good question. Uh, know when it's happening and for me, spend time in nature, um, really important. Um, you know, if, if we're spending our time protecting this thing, then at least spend time and enjoy it as well. Yes, and I just wanted to check that we we got to the bottom of, I don't quite sure that we did, um, of Becca's question here, which is what are your thoughts on the ongoing dialogue? Because this is a very, very loud dialogue at the moment about the ways that, about people putting people off the, um, off activism and off the, the, the cause by doing some things that are seen as not, not okay. The, the evidence suggests that it might put people off the group, but then that J, JSO and XR aren't meant to be popularity contests, but it doesn't actually put them off the cause. The key response I've started saying to people who don't like Just Stop Oil's methods, but agree with the cause is saying, well, OK, what would you do? And they would be like, well, I would do this and this. I'm like, OK, go and do it. You know, absolutely humiliate Just Stop Oil, prove them wrong by going and doing your thing and showing how much more effective it is and what a ridiculous idiot Roger Hallam is for his stupid methods. Go and humiliate him. He'd love it. You know, it's like, go, go and do it. If, if you think you've got a better option, please do. And actually, it probably is needed in the ecosystem of um, interventions. Yes. And um, and I, I believe that we talked about when we talked previously, there was some evidence to suggest that that is the case as well, that some work has been done. I think it was Bristol University. To prove who was it was it you charlie that mentioned that um, and there, there are some um social psychologists at, at bristol university colin davis is one doing research yeah. on this and yeah the, 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 the evidence so far seems to show 
that this isn't um, it doesn't you know put people off what i'd say to everyone on this call and everyone who does work in, in other things more socially acceptable things is that every time you hear an argument like this is an opportunity for you to to sell um other things you're involved with and to, to recruit people to those and and it's a wonderful opportunity because it you can put people on the spot make people squirm um and you know because the one thing that is not a reasonable position to take here and in fact an immoral position is doing nothing so when um you know, when, when people express displeasure at some type of action, this is an opportunity to, um, well, I think we need to listen to them to understand their, their framings and why why they, they don't like it. Um, and we need to, you know, this is an opportunity to, 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 to present those people with things that they can do, because nobody, I, I don't think, you know, it, it, it's not, it's immoral it's not socially acceptable to be doing nothing and nobody wants to admit that they would prefer to do nothing so this is an opportunity to, to encourage people to do other things lovely just i i know we're running out of time but there's one thing i really wanted to come to if i may someone mm -hmm. said about um we're working with young people and are worried about legislation that's making pretty much all activism illegal um there definitely are restrictions going in that are very heavy and authoritarian but i think it's worth getting away from the idea that all activism is being made illegal they, they literally can't do that with the european convention of human rights and if you're in any way worried about arrest the trick is to make your protest socially impactful but completely lawful so that they can't argue with it. This is what I did. I, I didn't have, I didn't have, didn't go and throw paint over anything. I just sat silently on the steps with a placard with my message written out. It's pure freedom of speech. They literally can't arrest you for it. If they do, they would be in trouble and, and it would make them look bad for doing so. So I, I'm really a proponent. If, if you feel like you're worried about getting arrested, just make it super, super legal, but socially impactful. Work out where will it be really awkward for me to sit with my views on the climate crisis peacefully written out and just sit there that, that you, you can still do that and i think it still has an impact um, and we should get away from the, the idea of saying to people that all activism is now illegal because it's not and there's there's so much you can do yeah i'm absolutely delighted that you two came on at this stage in the conference because now people have a whole sort of two days to think about it and they can they know who you are they can contact you what i'm also going to say is that that webinar chat and the q a was so important that i really want to make sure ali's listening i know she is um that we make sure that we've got that as well so we're going to keep the chat keep the questions and also this video will be online afterwards as well so thank you so much both of you and i'm sure that we'll knock into you at some point um, are you going to be here over the next few days, couple of days, or no? Sadly, not. But we know. I mean, I, 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 I don't actually have a link at the moment. I'm quite interested to come now, so maybe you can send me the link. That'd be great. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, thank you so much, guys. And we're going to have to. I'm going to go backstage now. Hope you are, and um, I'll see you all around, everybody. So I will be here for the next couple of days. Thank you.